a young donkey was the sign of a king coming in peace. The multitude of people recognized something extraordinary was happening when he mounted the donkey and rode into Jerusalem. Messianic fever ran high every Passover because they were remembering that how God had delivered them from Egypt and from their oppressors in Egypt. And they were hoping the same thing would happen. And, and they'd say, maybe this year, maybe this year the Messiah is going to come. I can imagine that they were hoping for deliverance from the Romans. And while the deliverance sought by the Jews was liberation from political oppression, we understand God's plan was much, much greater. It was nothing less than the redemption of the whole world. Deliverance from the oppression of sin. Jesus' recent miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead confirmed in many minds this is the Messiah. If Jesus had been avoiding confrontation with the Jewish leaders for weeks, and yet now, he was openly and majestically entering the city. His hour had come. And the crowd, recognizing the symbolism, began to lay palm branches and their outer garments on the road to honor a king. It was a custom to spread coats and palm branches on the road as the honored leader approached the city gates. And their cries of Hosanna were worthy of were worthy exclamations of praise, meaning, save us, save now. And Mark adds, they were also shouting, blessed is the ones, is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. <coughs> when the disciples realized Jesus was riding openly into Jerusalem, their, their spirit soared at last. At last, Jesus was openly declaring himself as the Messiah. He was riding into Jerusalem to take his place on the throne of David. Jesus, who had resisted the crowd's desire several times to make him king, was now accepting these accolades from the crowd. As one commentator describes the scene, what a shock it must be to see what appears to the entire city of Jerusalem was welcoming Jesus as well as the disciples with open arms. I can see Peter and John giving each other a high five and, and saying, wow, at last they'd arrived. The, Messiah, the Messianic kingdom is beginning. But we also find that not everybody was cheering. Verse 41, Jesus was weeping. He knew the future of Jerusalem. <laughs> He knew it was going to be in just about 40 years after this, a little less than 40 years, would be destroyed by the Romans. Also, some Pharisees were present, most likely surprised that Jesus, who had proven so elusive, was now right there in plain view. What a shock. It would have been seeing the whole city of Jerusalem welcoming Jesus as the Messiah with open arms. The presence of large crowds convinced the Jewish leaders to avoid arresting Jesus during the Passover. Several times as we read the Gospels about this, they would always, always say, we want to arrest him, but not during the Passover. To many people around. The crowds would stone us if we tried to arrest Jesus. And by the way, that's one reason why they did it so very early in the morning. They arrested him about midnight, and they had the trials during the nighttime, illegally, by the way, and then took him before Pilate as early as they could at daybreak. So Jesus, the whole thing, before even the crowds were awake, they had done their deed. And he condemned Jesus. 600 years before, the prophet Zechariah had made this very prediction about the Messiah who was going to ride in Jerusalem on a donkey. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, 
O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He's just endowed with salvation, humble, mounted on a donkey, even a colt to pull the donkey. The followers of Jesus recognized this significance. They enthusiastically were shouting, Hosanna, praise to the king of Israel. At last, Jesus was coming as the Messiah. You know, it was a genuine offer. Publicly, the offer of the Davidic kingdom wasn't, was by riding into Jerusalem on the Sunday morning, up openly and publicly declaring himself the Messiah. But that genuine offer was rejected. Even though many people got caught up in the in the exuberance of the moment, their understanding was shallow. Those who should have and could have welcomed the Messiah, the leaders of Israel, rejected the offer. They made their minds up earlier. Instead of accepting him as Messiah, he had to be eliminated. Jesus was the threat. A warrant for his arrest had been issued, but not during the Passover. It was not... It was interesting that they had temporarily decided to leave Jesus alone. But notice that Jesus chose the hour of his death. Because Israel's rejection of Jesus as the Messiah, the fulfillment of the Davidic kingdom was postponed. Israel's participation in the plan was placed on hold, so to speak. Emphasis was shifted to the Gentile world and to the church. The Bible clearly teaches a literal fulfillment of the prophecies of an early messianic kingdom, of an earthly messianic kingdom. Messiah Jesus will ride into Jerusalem on a white horse, taking his place on the kingdom, on the throne of David. Every promise made to Israel will be literally fulfilled. Revelation 19 speaks of Jesus coming, entering the, in the eastern gate, but not on a donkey, but on a white horse of war. But in another very real sense, the kingdom of God was initiated as a result of Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice did open the gate into a spiritual kingdom. <clears throat> And the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9 was fulfilled. The king did come. He came humbly, mounted on a donkey. He came as a righteous one, the sinless one, endowed with salvation. And Jesus entered Jerusalem openly in such a manner to force a confrontation. Why? Because he came to Jerusalem to die. He came to offer himself as the Lamb of God that was going to solve our sin problem. He came to complete the work of salvation by which every believer enters the invisible kingdom of God. As we move now past Palm Sunday to the next day where we find open confrontation with the leaders it's during this week that we observe Jesus was no longer avoiding confrontation. In fact, he was inviting it. And his actions and teachings were calculated to expose them, to expose the evil in their hearts, their sinfulness. And the crowds continued to be fascinated by this open conflict. You see, the common people had very little love or respect for these leaders. We find something very interesting about the temple grounds. The temple grounds were, you had the temple itself, in which was divided into the holy place and the holy of holies. But we also find that in the Old Testament before the Babylonians came, that Israel had, had slipped into such gross idolatry and they even had uh, pagan gods inside the temple. 
and God's Shekinah glory had left the temple. We read about this in Ezekiel. And it never returned. The Ark of the Covenant that was in the Holy of Holies was lost when the Babylonians came and, and uh, destroyed the temple. And it's never been found. We don't know what happened to it. Most likely the Babylonians took it and melted it down and made something out of it. We really don't know. If it was found, it would probably be very a very significant thing, but it probably won't. So what was in the temple that was rebuilt? Zerubbabel's temple. Well, there was no Ark of the Covenant. There was no holy Shekinah glory of God in that. In fact, it was just a, a rock. And that's where the high priest would pour out the blood of the sacrifice once a year. We wonder why the high priest during Jesus' time, who were political appointees, were able to do that without any kind of uh, repercussions from the holiness of God. Well, the holiness of God wasn't there. It was just an empty ritual. And the temple was a place of worship and it had value as a symbol, but the, the cultus and so forth of uh, the sacrifices and so forth were reminded the people that they needed to have a relationship with God. And Jesus said that this, my house, is a house of prayer. And that's why when the, uh, the ruling leaders of Israel had, uh, uh, the Sadducees were the ones who actually were the high priestly families. They were political appointees by Rome. And they would, uh, they, they had the uh, concessions, so to speak. They were the ones that made money from the, from all the uh, money changers and the sale of the sacrificial animals and so forth. And you can imagine, because around the outer, uh, around the temple itself were several courts, and the outer court was the court of the Gentiles. It was where anyone could come and worship, and they were people who had come from all over, and they weren't Jewish, but they would come to worship. But it was here that that, was, that, that area was fouled by the the, the uh, leavings from the animals and it was not a place where they could worship and that's where Jesus came in the next morning Monday morning Jesus came in and cleansed the temple and he threw over the the, uh, the tables of the money changers and he, he drove them out and drove all the animals out and said you're making my house a house of commerce. It's just like a marketplace. It's not a place of prayer. And Jesus cleansed the devil. He had done that also at the very beginning of his ministry. We read of these actions in Matthew chapter 21. Verses 12. Jesus entered the temple, drove out all those who were buying and selling, overturned the tables of the money changers, the seats of those who were selling doves, and said, My house should be called a house of prayer. But you're making a robber's den. At the beginning of the ministry, Jesus did this, but he did it also again. It's in the Talmud that we read, and that's, that's the Jewish commentary on the Old Testament, but it also says that uh, the whole business operation belonged to the family of Annas, the high priest. When Jesus upset the merchants, he was depriving these chief priests of, it, of revenue. He was hitting them right in their wallet, in their wallets. And they explains largely the opposition of the Sadducees. They were the really aristocratic class of Israel and Jerusalem. The high priest of this period was named Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the son-in-law of Annas, 
is interesting that the chief priests that the Gospels talk about are Annas, Caiaphas. These men were not even Levites. They were just people that were appointed by the Romans. And that's why they were afraid if Jesus was accepted as Messiah that they'd be kicked out. And that was one of their uh, one of their things. But Jesus didn't stop his condemnation just with the Sadducees. He also accused the other Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes. For example, look at verse 28 of this same chapter. It says, Jesus told a parable, it says, What do you think the man had two sons? He came to the first, said, Son, go work in the vineyard. He answered, I won't. The laughter where he regretted and went. The man came to the second, did the same thing, and he says, I will, sir, but he didn't go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, The first. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, Tax collected into the kingdom of God for you. Strong words. We look at verse 33. We see they continued and said and gave the, the parable of the landowner who built, uh, he had a vineyard. And when it came time for the harvest, he sent his servants and they, they mistreated his servants. And finally he said, well, I'll send my son. And they'll respect my son. What did they do? They killed the son. And the Pharisees knew Jesus was talking to them. He said in the words in verse 42, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected that became the chief cornerstone? This came about from the Lord that's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, a king, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, given to a people producing fruit of it. That was the Gentiles. And Jesus was, was prophesying that the kingdom would be given to the Gentiles. Jesus was clearly setting the stage. Another challenge was raised by the Herodians. They were the ones who supported Herod's dynasty and they tried to set a trap for Jesus and they gave, came up with the idea that uh, there was a man who had a wife and he died so his brother married the wife and then that man died and it went down through seven sons and they, they kind of sat back and said well whose wife will he be in the, in the resurrection see they didn't believe in the resurrection and Jesus said misunderstand that there's no marrying and giving me marriage in heaven. Jesus was clearly setting the stage for his arrests, his trials, his crucifixion. He deliberately and publicly condemned all the rulers Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the Herodians, everyone who was of the leading, leading of Israel. But many were attracted by the truth of what Jesus said. Jesus was teaching with authority. And I believe that many of those people, the common people, and even the many of the priests, we're, safe, we're still around on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples of 120 in the upper room. And as they spread the gospel in all the languages of people who were there, it says 6,000 people, 3,000 people, many would come to know Jesus at that time. As they watched this confrontation going on in the temple grounds, they could see, and as they remembered in the future, 
This was the Messiah. This was the Messiah who gave his life for the sins of the world. The disciples didn't understand that at that particular time. They didn't understand that the Messiah had to die. But that's what Jesus came to do. That was his purpose in coming. And he chose the hour of his death. And as they said, not during the Passover, Jesus, in his mind was saying, yes, during the Passover, during the very hour that the lambs were slain, the memorial lambs, Jesus died and shed his blood for the sins of the world. Shall we pray? Father, your timing is always perfect. We don't always understand, even as the disciples didn't understand, but it became clear after the resurrection. Father, we thank you that we live on this side of the cross, that we live on this side of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And we know that the sacrifice for our sins has been paid. We thank you that we can have a personal relationship, a relationship when our personal sins are forgiven. And we thank you for that, Lord.